holy, 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 holy is the land, holy is the land, holy, holy.
giving thanks in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I am Brother Robert Bryant, and welcome to the Christian Center Worship Service. The next voice you'll hear will be that of our pastor, Apostle Robert Bryant. Jesus is holy. Jesus is holy. Holy is the Lamb. Amen. God bless you, children of God. We do greet each of you once again in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus Christ, our strength, our redeemer, our very present help in a time of trouble. We do thank God for another opportunity to worship him in the beauty of his holiness, in spirit and in truth. Our God is a mighty God who reigns from heaven above with what? Wisdom, power, and love. We thank God for being who he is and doing all the things that he does. For those of you that have been worshiping with us, you know we just finished our most recent topic entitled what? All unrighteousness. We thank God for everything that he revealed to us and shared with us concerning unrighteousness and and, and how that sin is uh, a lot broader than we may think. As the scripture tells us, all unrighteousness is sin. It brings us on down to something that the Lord shared with us earlier today, and we're just going to see how the Lord develops this particular topic. So what you want to grow. So what you want to grow. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of times in life, people are not happy with, with what has come up, whether it is in marriage, whether it is in finances, whether it is in, in their own physical health whether it is in, in, in ministry and all kinds of things. And oftentimes, you know, when you find individuals that are displeased with what has come up, oftentimes it is because God was not pleased with what they sowed. Huh? Oftentimes when, when men and women are not pleased with what has come up in their life, in their business, in their nation, in their, uh, oftentimes it's a reflection that God was not pleased with what you and I planted. So let us sow what we want to grow. We're going to look at capital A in our outline. We're going way, way back to something the Lord said way back in the book of Genesis. Capital A, seed time, what? And harvest. Children of God, we cannot get around this here to save our life. Seed, time, and harvest. From the book of Genesis, chapter 8, with a very special focus on verse 22. And we're just going to move as the Spirit of God gives us utterance, however, and through whoever he sees fit. Bible says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. 
cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Capital A, seed time and harvest. Now we're talking about sowing what you want to grow. Understand that there is a seed time and there's a harvest time. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, blessed Father, for being awesome in this place, for being awesome in your people, for being awesome in all creation. We bless your holy name. We exalt you. We laud and magnify your holy name. You are God and beside you there is none other. We join in with the heavenly choir crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Day and night, Father, you have told us in your word, they never stop saying, well, Father, we are joining in right now uh, from the earth, declaring your glory, declaring your might, declaring your presence, declaring your sovereignty, your dominion, declaring, Father, that you are uh, the creator of all things. You are the preserver of light and life. You are everything that we need. You are our shield, our buckler, our strength, our redeemer, our protector, our provider, our very present help in a time of trouble. You are our comforter, our counselor. Father, you are simply our everything. You are our reason for living, our reason for giving. Father, you in you, we have our being and we have our purpose. We thank you today, Father, for uh, being so good to us, for being merciful, for kind, being so kind. We even thank you, Father, for your rebuke. We thank you, Father, for your chastisement, for even in that you chastened us in love, that we may be greater partakers of your holiness, of your divine nature, of your eternal splendor. Father, thank you today. Thank you. We've entered into your gates this afternoon with thanksgiving. We've entered into your courts with praise. The, the, we're offering the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise. Father, we are presenting our bodies before you as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. For you have told us that this is our spiritual act of worship. Father, we ask that you will speak to us this evening. Give us words of wisdom. Open our eyes of understanding. Take these ancient words, Father, that you've spoken to and through your prophets thousands of years ago. Father, show us how relevant they are to us today and into, into the generation and the dispensation in which we live. Father, as you do these things for us, we will be most careful to give you all glory, all the honor, and all the praise. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen. As long as the earth remains. Now we see something here, children of God, and, and we want to we want to keep this in mind that God is a pattern God. Just just bear that in mind. He's a pattern God. Every creature in creation has patterns. How is it we are able to catch mice in a mice trap? On in in Africa, we use a sticky board. How is it that we have we're able to catch a mice? Because mice have certain patterns, and and what we are able to do, whether it be a mice trap here in the U.S. with a little piece of cheese, so that he go in and take the cheese and get his neck snap, or when we put down a glue board in Africa and they run across the glue board and get themselves stuck on it, and you get them the next morning. Why? Because their patterns. Their patterns rarely change. And, and when you know a being's pattern, you can almost predict its next course of what? Action. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. God, who created man first in his image and in his likeness, was not pleased with what man did. Ultimately, man ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sin entered into humanity. And that step down continue to be more and more step downs unto the place where God decided that he would destroy just about everybody. Hmm? All kinds of things that he had created, God decided to destroy them and basically start almost afresh. Now, if you will notice in the book of Genesis chapter eight, um, Verse 15, 
when it was time for Noah to come out of the ark, the Bible says, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, watch this, so that they can multiply on the earth, be fruitful, and increase in number upon it. Does it sound familiar? Go back to the book of Genesis. Verse, chapter 1, verse 22. God blessed them, or Adam and the woman, and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. So what are you saying, Apostle? God says something very similar to Noah that he said to Adam. Well, why was it God had to say, or why is it God said something very similar to Noah, Noah that he said to Adam? Well, basically because Adam didn't listen very well. And what you want to understand and keep in mind, child of God, is that if you won't listen very well, God has got somebody that will. God has got somebody that he will use to do the job that he had intended for what? You and I to do. Don't think that you are uh, irreplaceable or that God can't get somebody. So God said, look, because God said, look, I've got a good pleasing and perfect will even if the ones that i want to use to fulfill it are not good pleasing and perfect uh oh god says my will my good pleasing and perfect will is going to be done with or without you this is not an instruction that is given to adam adam had his chance he didn't quite do it like god wanted it done so god said all right let me let me erase and let me start again. May God not have to start again in your ministry in the name of Jesus. May God not have to start again in your marriage in the name of Jesus. May God not have to kill you so that he can bring the wife in. That'll, that'll help the man of God do what he's supposed to do. May God not have to kill you, husband, that, that, that God may have to bring in the husband that will treat the woman of God like you're supposed, that's supposed to be treated. May God not have to kill you, parents, that he might have the children raised by somebody that's going to raise them like he want them raised. May God not have to kill you, children, like he did with Job, that, that God may replace them with some other children. Let us faithfully do what God wants us to do so that we don't have to be replaced. Oh, come on now. You all are sports people. We live in a sports generation, a sports dispensation. Normally, you don't have to go to your bench and bring in a substitute. Come on, somebody. If the players on the field or on the court are doing just what you want them to do. All right. Normally, substitutes are brought in when the original is not doing their job. The reason why the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons and rams and sheep had to be presented was because man did not do his job. So God had to bring in a sacrifice for sin. He had to bring in a substitute. So these animals and the shedding of their blood was a substitute for the sin. God said, I'm too holy to look upon sin. I got to have something that is going to make atonement. And God said, now what I could have done, whoa, watch this now. Thank you, Father. God said, what I could have done was killed you. And that been sufficient. But God said what I'm requested was the blood of these animals to make atonement, to bring us back into fellowship. So we see God saying some of the same things to Noah that he said to Adam. The Bible says, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark. Verse 15. You, your wife, your sons, and your wives. Now, now, God says, Robert, this is very important, and, and you know I want you to keep this in mind, but my people need to hear this. Noah preached righteousness for 120 years, man of God. He preached while he was building the ark, Noah was preaching righteousness in his generation and in his day. And his congregation ended up being nobody else other than his natural family. 
120 years he preached righteousness. Not, not like Noah was just building an ark and won't say nothing, won't tell people what's going on. He was preaching hard and heavy for 120 years. And the only one that ended up getting the message that, that, that God had placed within him was his own his natural family. Because out of all of this preaching and teaching and, and exhorting that Noah did for those 120 years while people saw him working on it all. It's not like Noah didn't have uh, uh, neighbors, just like we have neighbors. They, they looking right at what he's doing. They, they, they know the shape of a, of a art. They knew that wasn't a new addition to his home. But they decided that they did not want to be a part of what he was doing. Well, you know, to them, just like to many of our neighbors, we we they, they they we look crazy to them. Why in the world they got to be having at church and studying God's word every night? Why? Because we know that there's gonna be a resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. That's why. We know that because we understand that we're gonna have to give an account of the deeds that we have done while in the earth. That's why. Noah was building the ark because Noah said, Look, I got a revelation from God that's different from you. Noah said, the reason why I'm doing things different from you next door and you next door is because I've got a revelation from God that's different from you next door and you next door. Noah said, I know what God is going to do. I know what's coming. And Noah, and I'm hearing Noah in the spirit that even if don't none of you all join me, my family is worth saving. If don't nobody hear this, this that I'm sharing during this 120 years, but my natural family, Noah said my natural family is, is worth saving. And that's who exactly who was saved. And all of that time, all of that preaching of righteousness and telling people of his generation, only eight souls were saved. Eight. We don't know how many thousands of people were on the earth. Say, nothing wrong with Noah's doctrine. It was just that God says the people of his generation did not want to hear that. Just as many people in this generation today, Robert Bryant, do not want to hear sound doctrine. Did not have my apostle prophesy that in the last days men would not endure sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own disciples. Because God said, look, Robert, anytime people don't want to hear me, they got an instead. Anytime people don't want to hear what I got to say, they, they've selected an instead. Whether that instead is television, whether that instead is Facebook, whether that instead is social media, whether that instead is work, whether that instead is sports. When people don't want to hear me, God said, Robert, they've chosen an instead. Instead to suit their own desires. Understand that it is human nature to gravitate toward those who are saying what you want to hear. It is what? Human nature to gravitate toward those who are saying what you want to hear. Now, this is where we're actually getting into tomorrow's topic a little bit, because as we're talking about this, the Lord gave me the second subtopic tomorrow. And you might can skip you some space in your notes and go on and write this down. Capital B. It's going to skip you a few lines. Go on down your note and write capital B, the condition of your soil. Because as we talk about sowing and reaping, it's not just the seed and the harvest that's involved in sowing and reaping. You too have to check into the condition of your what? Soil. Because you can have real, real good seed and real, real bad soil and not end up with a harvest at all. Check the conditions. So we're not we're not gonna go into that too much right 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 there. So in other words, God's saying, look, you need to check. And, and you need to check what it is you really want to hear. Because that's what you're going to gravitate toward. I, man of God, I think I shared, I don't know if I shared this with you uh, some time ago. But I know I shared it with the saints here. First time I went to Nigeria, uh, I was with the host pastor that, that had invited me down. And he introduced me to one archbishop there in, uh, in Lagos. Had a very large congregation, but it was kind of like out in the bush, off from a Coco, a Coco Michael area down there. And uh, me and the man of God, we immediately connected and we were sitting in uh, the host pastor's office and he was talking about how he had to, you know, go do some counseling and, and different things. And uh, and I shared with him. I said, you know, I said, man of God, I said, I don't do a whole lot of counseling. He said, what? Apostle? I said, man of God, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of counseling. He said, Apostle, why? Why not? I said, because, you know, there's a passage in Proverbs that God gave me a revelation concerning. I want you to find it. And the, the passage says this. That he who seeks good hmm, finds what? Goodwill. But evil comes 
to him who searches for it. I said, man of God, I said, I don't do a whole lot of counseling. I said, because people get what they're really looking for. Because what you are really looking for, that's what you're going to get. If you are really looking for good, you're going to find goodwill. But then the Bible says evil comes to him who searches for it. So you don't. So what you see is a whole lot less energy has, goes into to receiving evil. Because all you got to do is be seeking evil and it will come to you. That's the people get what they're, what they're really looking for. And what people have in their lives, for the most part, is a reflection of what they have really been looking for. And it's, it's man of God. I said, man of God, I said that guy. And I knew that that, that, had, that had been a blessing to him. Because see, a lot of times we can, if we're not careful, we can spend a whole lot of time trying to get people to want something that they don't really want. Getting people to try to look for something that they don't, they don't, they don't, they're not, they don't really want to look for. You know, this is this this walk with Christ is a is a let whomsoever will. Let whomsoever will. Know what's to look now. I'm you know, I'm telling you all what's right, and I'm doing what God has said. Now, you, don't you know that if some other people would have shown some interest? And some other people would have repented in their day. Do you think that God would have denied them on that ark? I don't believe so. But it's obvious from our, the scripture says what the people were doing up until the day Noah entered the ark. They were eating, what? And drinking. They were what? Marrying and what? Giving into marriage right up until the day that Noah entered into the ark. In other words, they were too busy with, what? Life was going on. Life was going on. They were doing their thing. But when the rains came, and it had never rained, it had never rained before. God was busting up springs of water was coming all up from the from out of the earth. And when the rains came, that's when people realized that they got the revelation, but it was too late. May you not get the revelation of God too late in your life. God's revelation always awaits a what? An appointed time. You can mess around and get the right revelation at the wrong time and it'd be just like you didn't get the right revelation. You think people in hell don't know that God is real? You think people in hell now don't know that hell is real? You think people in hell don't realize now that they should have been saved? They should have lived for God? They got the revelation now, but I'm hearing God say it's too late. Getting the revelation too late can almost be like not getting a revelation. All right. All right. God said, give him a parable. Robert, give him people a parable. You find out three days after the chicken wing giveaway that they were giving away chicken wings at the Chinese restaurant downtown Kenston. We find out three days after the chicken wing giveaway. We got the revelation. Hmm? Well, I'm saying, but we ain't got no chicken wing. We got the revelation, but we got it too late. So because we got the revelation too late, it's just like we ain't got the revelation because we surely got no chicken wings. You get a report that they're hiring at one of the local factories, but you get the report after they have filled all the position. Revelation, but it's too late. We want to get the revelation. This is why God said you, you all need to stick close to me so that you can get revelation at the appointed time. You can get the revelation where you have time to do something about it. You get the revelation. Huh? What? All right. Understand that windows, they open and they close. We talk about the windows of heaven, God opening up the windows of heaven. God said the same way I can open up the windows of heaven. And, and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. God said, I can close the windows of heaven too. And you'll be wondering, when, when am I ever going to receive? Come out. Come out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you. Birds of the air and all the creatures that move along the ground. So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number. Be fruitful and increase. Now, um, man of God and I were talking earlier today because I've been talking with one, one friend of mine for much of the day and going back and forth on the internet. 
and studying about uh, cloning. Now, you remember Dolly? What was Dolly? Lamb that was cloned back in about 1990s, early 90s. Well, the reality was, and, and this is documented, you, you can find it, they've got about 25 different species of animals that they have cloned. Mm -hmm. Water buffalo, horse, pig, mice. They got different kinds of fish that they had cloned. And and as we were discussing the cloning, I, I was saying, I said, I said, look now, I said, if they have cloned a, a dolly or a lamb or what have you and got all these other animals, I said, you're not going to tell me that they stopped there, you know, and, and, and left it there. So I typed in on my computer, have human beings been cloned? Have human beings been cloned? And the answer came back, the very first article that I saw was the answer was yes. Back in 1995, you had some scientists that were working in some, some privately funded labs. See, when you're dealing in privately funded labs, you're not under the same, you can do a whole lot of things that you may not be able to do in a government funded lab. And they hauled off and they had taken us some cells out of the leg of one of the scientists and mixed it up some kind of way with a, a with a, a embryo of a of a cow for some reason they were compatible and it worked and the, the cloned skin cells of one of these scientists began to grow and develop now what they said in the article was that when it got to the 32nd division you know cells multiply one turns into two two turns into four Four turns into eight, and that's how that's how our cells multiply and start forming all of these. When it got to thirty second cell, they they destroyed it. They destroyed it. I mean, you know, it, now it would have been something to see had it went on and developed into a a fetus and a baby. But at that embryonic stage, according to the article, they destroyed they destroyed it, and you know because they were concerned about ethical questions and. And, you know, making sure that they had, you know, talk with the right people in authority before they, they did that kind of thing. And then you had some 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 scientists in, in a Asian country that had did the same thing and they destroyed it. They destroyed the, the embryo. They didn't use a um, they didn't use a calf. They used actual female egg and and it began to develop and it got up to the stage, the eight eight cell stage and they destroyed it as, as well. They destroyed it as well, you know. But then again, this is what they telling us on the internet. Now, more than likely, if this is what they telling us, you know, there's probably a whole lot more to this that we don't know. And that was 20 years ago. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised at all if some confessions didn't come out maybe in the next few years that... I'm a clone, you know, and, and they bring out the host and all, all kind of things like that, you know, because you, you've got, you know, as we've talked about, God will allow human wisdom to, to go so far. He'll allow it to go so far, you know, and even even at that, it's not like man is, is creating anything because he's still working with what God has given. Still got to work with, 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 you know, the skins, that which God, God is the one who gave the skin cells in the first place. God is the one, even if they used a, a, a calf uh, embryo or calf, that God is the one that, that made that. So, you know, you're not going to get past God no matter what, you know, God allows you to do. At some point, you're going to have to deal with the creator of all things and the preserver of light and light. So we see, uh, we see something here. Be fruitful and increase in number god is 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 always about fruitfulness before increase keep that in mind in other words god is about getting things right before he's about expanding things now god says given the parable robert as i just shared with you how do cells uh what is that mitosis what meiosis or mitosis when cells develop when cells divide one turns into two, two turns into four, four turns into eight, eight turns into 16. This is the way that God has set up cells to, to multiply in order to form us as, as human beings. 
Now, when you get cancer, now, because remember, anything that goes on in the physical body, it goes on in the spiritual body. All right. So there's an orderly, there's an orderly development that's supposed to take place even in the body of Christ. Well, sometimes in the body of Christ, people get cancer. Now, what cancer is cancer in the natural, because God says just like you have a cancer in the natural, you have cancer in the spiritual. Cancer in the natural is when you have an abnormal cell in the first place. Now, normal cells, they be right. And they turn into two more normal cells that turn into eight more normal cells that you no know, one turns into two, two turns into four. But when you have when your individual has cancer, what cancer is, it's an abnormal cell in the first place. And it's an abnormal cell that multiplies in an abnormal way. So instead of that one crazy cell, you got a regular cell over here, you got a crazy cell or a cancer cell over here. That regular cell will turn into two more regular cells, which will turn into four more regular cells, which will turn into eight more regular. But when you got a cancer cell, that one crazy cell, that one cancer cell won't turn into two. It might turn into 50. And that 50 might turn into 195 and 195 might turn into 6,700. And if normally and oftentimes if cancer is not dealt with at in its early stages, it kill people. It kill people. Well, understand that just as there is cancer in the physical body, God said, Robert, there is cancer in the spiritual body. Unsound doctrine, unsound teachings that are very popular now. Because remember, cancer cells said, look, I'm not, I'm not the fewest of cells. This black cancer cell said it'd be a whole lot of us. We just be wrong. God did not say that 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 unsound doctrine in the last days would be unpopular. The Bible says, God said, Robert, tell them what my words say, that in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desire, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching is. And the King James Version says they will heap to themselves. They'll get a whole lot of that. So what we see is that God said, look, I'm more concerned with fruitfulness first. That's what God says. I do everything decently and on order. That's why I didn't tell Noah, multiply and then concern yourself with fruitfulness. I told him, be fruitful. And increase in number. So Noah came out together with his sons, his wife. And his sons, his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that moved along the ground and all the birds and everything that moves on the earth came out of the ark one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals. Now, this is where we got to dispel another, another myth in the body of Christ that the animals came to Noah to by what? Two. Well, let's go on and kick that on out the window. The animals came to Noah, the, the unclean animals, no animals that were not used for sacrifice and animals that were not eaten. They came to Noah two by two. But the animals, the clean animals that Noah and them had to eat during this journey and Noah and them had to, to sacrifice during this journey, they came to Noah how? Seven by seven. Let's turn quickly back to the book of Genesis, chapter seven, verse one. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you what? Seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal. See, if, 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 if they all the animals that come two by two, somebody must around and get hungry and eat one of the chickens. That's it for chicken. Somebody get hungry. We ain't got them two by two, male and his mate of clean animals. We get hungry on the ark. How long they stay in the ark? 40 days or so. We get hungry. Somebody in there cook up some chicken. Then that's the end for the chicken population. So what we got, God said, look, take with you seven of every kind of clean animal. So you got six, you got six males and six females. Y'all can eat or sacrifice or whatever else you got to do. As long as you have that one male and one female when it's time to come out of the ark to replenish 
the earth. God knows what he's doing. So they came out. And Noah built an, an altar to the Lord and taking some of the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on them. What if he had took unclean? First of all, he'd have been wrong for sacrificing unclean animals, number one. But what would have happened to the unclean animal population if he took? It'd have been finished. To make. The Bible says the Lord smelt the pleasing aroma. Now understand that, that God said, Robert, my people need to understand this about me. That just as you all have pleasing aromas, man of God cooked that 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 stew in there the other night. We were smelling it. Long before it, long before it came off the came off the stove, we were smelling. It. Me and RJ was ready to get in that stew just based on the what? The smell. We've got pleasing aromas. God say, I too have pleasing aromas. And just as we have pleasing aromas, we have what? Displeasing aromas. Now, we've got to be careful with displeasing aromas because there are some foods that smell very, very bad. But they taste what? Very, very good. See, well, certain types of cheese, certain types of, you know, you got some people that, that love the taste of chitlins. But they don't love the smell. Now, chitlins are basically intestines, man of God. That's, that's a very popular dish over here among many African Americans. They're the intestines and they stink while you're cooking them, but you get them right with the hot sauce and the vinegar, and a lot of people love them, love them over here. All right. See, now God doesn't have to be careful with displeasing aromas because if the aroma displeases God, God's going to do something about it. If the aroma is displeasing to God. He's going to eventually, he's going to do something about it. But this particular aroma, a pleasing aroma, the Bible says the Lord smelt the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of man. God said, I didn't, I didn't say I wouldn't curse man. I wouldn't say I won't curse the, the ground. Because you read a little bit later on in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Blessings and curses. If, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1, if you fully obey the Lord your God, if, and carefully keep all his commands I give you this day, the Lord your God will set you high. But then God come back and say, now if you don't, all these curses will come upon you. God said, I won't curse the ground again because of man. Even though every inclination of, watch this now, because this is much like, thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm just seeing this after 30 years. Remember we had talked some time ago about how God told us in, in Ecclesiastes that when we guard our steps, when we enter the house of God, how that, you know, to let our words be what? Few. Let our words be few. Well, God didn't say that he wanted his words to be few. He told us to let our words be few. But watch this right here, what, what God says. Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart Every inclination of his heart is evil. God said, I didn't say my heart. So what actually happens to you and I when we are born again is there is a heart transplant. God says, I will write my laws and my decrees upon their hearts. When, when Christ saves us, when we are saved, Satan, who is at the center of our heart, working in, our, in the very essence, his spirit is at the very essence of our human spirit, and, and, and this is working in our soul. All of this forms our heart. Satan is removed, and God now implants himself, the essence of himself, his spirit, the same spirit that God has on the throne in heaven, he has now planted inside of our human spirit. Scripture says, do you not know that your body, what, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So what God has done in the Old Testament, you had the Holy of Holies. You had the inner court. You had the what? Outer court. Outer court could be visibly seen all around. Then you got to go in a little bit deeper into the inner court. This is where most of the activities took place in the inner court. Then you had the Holy of Holies. This was only reserved for certain people and certain artifacts. Well, our body is like the temple. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. So inside of our spirit, just as in the in the Holy of Holies, in the, the physical temple, 
There were only certain individuals that could go in there and there were only certain artifacts that could go in there. God only wants certain things in your spirit. Your spirit is much like the Holy of Holies. God said, the, the whole, God said, look, in the old covenant, if the priests, only certain priests could go in there and they had to be just right to enter into the Holy of Holies. If not, they go in with bells on them and a rope tied around them. As long as you heard the jingling, jing, 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 priest was all right. He was doing his duty. But if you ever heard the jingling stop, you didn't go run in and pull him out. You took the rope and you pulled him out. That meant he had some iniquity in him. He wasn't right before the Lord and God would strike him dead. Why? Because only certain things, only certain individuals, only certain artifacts were to go into that Holy of Holies. God only wants certain things in your spirit and my spirit. Our spirit, our human spirit is like the Holy of Holies. Then you had the inner court, which is where most of the activity of the worship took place in the inner court. Well, most of the decisions, the decisions and the choices that you and I make as human beings, that's that's symbolic. And that's like our soul. Your soul is where all the choices, the choice to wear this pair of pants today, the choice to drive this car, the choice to eat this food, the choice to exercise, the choice to st all our choices come right out of that soul. And then you got our, our outer court, which is our physical body. This is the part that can be seen. Everybody see, you can't see my spirit, you can't see my soul. You can see the manifestations of it. But what you see when you look at me, what I see when I look at you is this physical body. So every inclination of his heart, God said what's got to happen to people is it has to be a heart transplant. A spiritual heart transplant where Satan comes out of that exalted seat in the hearts of men and women. He, it, Satan is sitting in such an exalted seat in the lives of men and women of this generation that the scripture says that the God of this age, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the glorious light of the gospel satan is sitting in an exalted seat if you are unsaved under the sound of my voice you need to understand that satan is sitting in an exalted seat in your heart and god wants to well i wants him cast down and cast out so that that exalted seat which is meant for god your spirit and my spirit were meant for god to occupy for god to sit on the throne can you imagine God get up in heaven and, and go somewhere and come back and and one of the angels sit, is sitting on the throne? Sitting on his throne or God get up and go somewhere and take care of one or two things and come back. And one of the living creatures then climbed up there on God's throne. Talking about, hey, hey, Lord, what's what's going on? It's going to be problem because that throne is reserved for God. Your spirit, my spirit. It's been reserved for God. If if Satan is sitting in in the throne of your heart, he's sitting there uh, uh, as a usurper. What a usurper is, is one who takes authority or takes power without without the proper uh, authorization. Satan has no business sitting in the hearts of men and women. Hearts of men and women is meant for God. You are meant to be led and directed by the spirit of God. You are meant to be living for God. So God says every inclination of man's heart is evil from childhood. Never again, God says, will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Now, we're going to get ready to close out here. Now, God says, now, here are some things that will remain. See, you got certain things that are temporal. You got certain things that are eternal. You got certain things that are temporal for a little while. And you got certain things that are temporal for a little longer while. God says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. See. Now, there's going to be a new heaven, hmm? a new what? A new earth, and there's going to be a new Jerusalem at the appointed time. But God says, as long as the earth remains, seed time time and harvest so these you know these are uh we talked about patterns these are patterns that god said are going to be in place as long as the earth remains 
Now, the Lord was dealing with me on something a, a, a little bit earlier. How that obedience, and I'm having to paraphrase because I'm not remembering exactly how he how he gave it to me now. That obedience is the greatest seed that you will ever sow in the kingdom of God. Obedience. Remember, they that are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. When we obey God, that's that's the greatest seed. Now, now here's here's why this is important, children of God, and this is going to be a blessing to you. You remember when Jesus was at the wedding feast in Cana, and they were out of wine. Mary came to him. You know, Mary was like, you know, we're out of wine. Jesus was like, woman, you know, why you got me involved in this? That's that's what 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 is this? But then Jesus said, uh, you know, he came on around, and he told him, he said, fill the jars with water. Hmm? He didn't say fill the jars with wine. He said fill the jars with water. When they had filled the jars with water, he turned the water into wine. Is that how our scripture read? Now, what God was dealing with me on, and again, I'm having to paraphrase, that when you obey God, you can reap that which is different from what you've sown because your obedience is the greatest seed. Your obe when you obey God, you can reap anything that God wants you to reap because that seed of obedience is so great. That seed of obedience makes impossible things possible. When you obey God now, that's, that, that's the key. They put water in the jug. But when they came to drink, it wasn't water that they drank. It was wine. So understand that your obedience to God is, is God simply saying, it's the greatest seed. It's the greatest seed. God said, when you obey me, I can bring anything up out of you. When you obey me, God says, I can use you for anything I want to use you. God said, when you obey me, I can I can take and turn. I, when you obey me, God says, nothing shall be impossible to them that believe. Because in order to, to obey God, you need to believe God. So just that obedience, you can you can sow what what may seem like a very small seed, mustard seed. But if you sow that seed in obedience to God, God said, I have the power to turn it into one of the largest trees known to man. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Just that seed of obedience. When God tells you to do something, see, you, you don't you don't know what God because because God is looking at you obeyed me. Just like inside of a man's sperm, you have DNA, deoxy, what? Ribonucleic acid, DNA. Inside of that little sperm, you can fit thousands, hundreds of thousands of them on the head of a pen, man of God. But inside of my sperm, inside of your sperm, inside of a man's sperm is all of the, the genetic material to create another man. Mm -hmm. All the genetic material to create another man, just like the one it came from. Now, it's in seed form. I see. And once that seed, you know, if that seed is allowed to grow, you'll, you'll find all the genetic material that made me. It was in, it's in my sperm. The, D, the DNA, it's the building block or the building material to make another me, to make another you. This is how they're able to clone animals. We were just talking about cloning. They take a, take a cell. Inside of the cell is all the information needed to make another one, another one of you. Inside the cell, it's right there. It just has to be developed. It has to go through certain stages, just like we had to go through stages to go from being little uh, uh, babies to young men. We had to go through stages. But inside of that DNA, see, well, you say, Apostle, what are you driving at? What God has done, the Bible says that he that is born of God doth not continue to sin because God's what? Seed remains in him. In other words, God said what I have done is seed from the Greek word sperma. God said what I've done is I've placed my sperm in you. And inside of my sperm, just like inside of your sperm, Robert Bryant, there's enough genetic material to make another you. God says inside of my sperm. 
There's enough genetic material, spiritual material to make another me. Doesn't the scripture call us gods to whom the word of the Lord came? So inside of that spirit. Now, if I had if I had some of my sperm right here, now we're not going to go too deep. But if I had some of my sperm right here and was holding my sperm up right here, right beside me, you would see a, a great difference. Why? Because I'm mature. My sperm is immature. And that's why a lot of times we don't look like God and we don't do like God. We'd be too mature, too immature. This is why God be telling us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because as we grow, that little sperm, as it grow, it'll turn into another me. As we grow and develop, there's going to come a day, man of God, when we're going to be just like him. Is anybody understanding what the spirit of God? So we got to grow and develop. You can't, you can't take no sperm, put no sperm beside me and say, man, you know, this sperm, the sperm has got the potential in it to make another me. So this is why God be saying, look, you got you to operate within the potential that I have given you because the potential that I have given you is unlimited. The potential that I have given you is a surpassingly great power that you can't even comprehend. But you got to come out of that little sperm, that little sperm uh, 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 state and come on into maturity. God says it's in you. Woman get pregnant, man of God. She don't show nine months as soon as she get pregnant for a long time. It don't even look like she's pregnant. But if she's pregnant, she is. Even though for a long time, she don't look like it. Well, what's happening? That fertilized egg. It's growing and developing. And why is it I don't look exactly like my father? Well, because not only did I have some of his genetic material from the sperm of my father, I had some of my mother's genetic material from the egg. So when my father's sperm fertilized my mother's egg, I took some of her 